G'day, mate. What's your name? My name is Lawrence Mooney. And what do you do, Lawrence? Oh, <laughs> feels so nice to be put in this position. Um, I'm a stand-up comedian, but uh, I would also say I contain multitudes. <laughs> Hello, welcome back to another episode of Crowd Workcast. My name's Andrew Barnett. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, my guest this week, Lawrence Mooney, uh, comedian, broadcaster. Uh, he's done TV, radio, absolutely everything in Australian comedy. Uh, very funny man. Uh, and he was good enough to come and uh, sit down and spend some time with me. It was a really, really interesting chat. He's, uh, yeah, he's a really interesting bloke, very uh, candid. So um, you're going to enjoy this episode. If you'd like to see Lawrence live... Uh, by the time this comes out, May 18 to 21, he'll be at the Brisbane Powerhouse as part of the Brisbane Comedy Festival. Um, so grab tickets at lawrencemooney.com or uh, go to alist.com and have a look for uh, his uh, tickets there. Uh, he's also got a book out called Embracing Your Limitations. Uh, very funny, very good book. So please uh, check that out if you, uh, if you like the written word. Uh, if you'd like to come see me live, um, I have the Sydney Comedy Festival coming up May 20th and 21st. Uh, I think the Saturday, the 20th, is selling really well, but there's still uh, a good number of tickets available for the Sunday. So uh, either of those, come along, grab your tickets now. Uh, I'd love to see you there. Uh, you can go to, uh, well, click just go to my link tree in my uh, Instagram, at Andrew Barnett Comedy. Uh, give us a follow there. If you're enjoying the podcast, like, subscribe, leave comments, reviews, all that good stuff. Anyway, that's enough from me. Let's get into the episode. This is me and Lawrence Mooney. Uh, I've been a stand-up comedian for 29 years. And so, at my next birthday, which is in a couple of weeks' time, it will have been half of my life. So I started when I was 29. I've been doing it for 29 years. And if, let's say, there's a third chapter and I live till I'm 87, some people would debate that, I think, what's going to happen with the next 29? What What is going to be my third chapter? Because I, I reckon you know, there's a point where you can't stand up anymore. Really? You can't do stand up. You, you see just, you're seeing it on the horizon or you just It just feels like I've said I've said enough. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I use the Powerball method. Like if you won Powerball tomorrow, you yep. know, twenty million dollars, what would you do? Would you keep doing stand up? I'd keep doing stand up. Um I wouldn't stress it as much. <laughs> I, and know, and I mean, and so would you change your stand-up, though? Would you start saying things differently? Would you feel more, um, you know, entitled is probably the word, to, to speak your mind? Maybe, yeah, maybe I'd be a little, a little more just speak my mind and see what happens, which I probably should be anyway. And that's the Powerball trick. Yeah. Ask people what they would do if they won Powerball. It's like, well, why don't you do it anyway? Yeah, because yeah, I'll buy a Ferrari and all that bullshit and a jet ski. Yeah. <laughs> I would never buy a jet ski. Um, but w if you won Powerball, what would you do? Just do that anyway. So I am actually thinking: Do I want to keep going in front of audiences? I love it, but I'd like to do something else as well. Well, what would you do? What well, is what is the Powerball situation look like for you? Um, the Powerball situation that, that has presented itself is. I rehomed a racehorse last year. I did these little vignettes for um, Ladbrokes, yeah. gamble responsibly. Oh, you've got to change that now. You've got to go think of what else you could be buying. There's new ones. Oh, right. Because yeah. gamble responsibly is simply the most contradictory, absurd phrase in the English language. Gamble, take a massive risk uh, with a whole lot of variables, but do it responsibly with a tempered approach and yeah. logic. It's like, no, no, it's, it it takes the work. fun out of gambling. Yeah, it's like gamble because you're gambling or be responsible, yeah. not, not both together. So I went out to a place called Ningen in Western New South Wales to the yep. Duck Creek Cup and uh, the horse that was favourite to win was a horse called Drunk as a Monkey. Big crowd favourite because of its name. Yep. And I was naturally attracted to it. We did this interview with the trainer, Brett Robb, and as I'm talking, I don't know anything about horses. The horse starts to lower its head, which means it's quite relaxed around me. And we're making eye contact, and then it starts leaning in on me. 
And Brett goes, geez, that horse is a real simpatico with you. Um, have you worked with horses before? And I said, no. Nah. We finished the interview and the horse is just like almost eating out of the palm of my hand. And he goes, listen, that horse really likes you. Would you do me a favour? Come and visit it before the race to relax it. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm a horse whisperer. Here we go. I'm a horse whisperer. Yeah. Or Brett was looking for the future owner of a shit race horse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's, so He's taught the horse to lean on people. Yeah. Uh, if, if it's not... Can you, yeah, make it make it be friendly to people if they're no good. Anyway, run second in the Duck Creek Cup. I say to him, what happens to the horse after its racing life? And he goes, oh, you know, we look for a good home for them. <laughs> I said, well, give me a call when its racing life's over. So half an hour later. Uh, <laughs> no. So he, a couple of weeks later, he rings me, he goes, drunkies run third in bad company and he's yours if you want him. I've spoken to the owners and I said, how much do they want? And this talks about the future of the horse. Mm. They don't want anything. He's free. Okay. You just have to pay for transport costs. So a three-year-old, stunning, thoroughbred horse, you know, and they sell for a million dollars at yearling sales or hundreds of thousands of dollars. He's yours for free. Is he gelded or is he... He's gelded. Yeah, so, so that they... takes a bit of value off. Yeah. So he came free, but boy, they're, they're expensive. They eat a lot, Barney. <laughs> and so my wife has fallen in love with the idea of saving all of the horses. Right. She wants to save all the horses. So her Powerball dream is that we buy a huge plot of land and just rehome racehorses and have them. Has she been watching a lot of Yellowstone? Or? She has. <laughs> Unbelievably, yes, she has. Because guess where we're going in July? We're going to Yellowstone. Oh, really? We're going to Yellowstone for a true horse training experience. So, yeah, she's gone full cowgirl. Oh, nice. Or is that reverse cowgirl? Reverse cowgirl. <laughs> You're reverse cowgirl. <laughs> she has gone full reverse cowgirl, which is awesome. Uh, <laughs> Boy, the hats are expensive too. So yeah. that is, that's her plan. Yeah, You know how, I think particularly kind of like women who were once supermodels, I think Britt Eklund did it or, and Pamela Anderson, they become really obsessed with saving animals. They yes. become animal liberationists. Well, my wife's going there. I'm not saying that she was previously a supermodel. She's hot, but yeah, she's going down that path of like, I don't want anything to do with humanity. I just want to save animals. That's um, yeah, that's an interesting. It's an interesting um, observation that it is, that 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 particular group. I'd, I'd never really thought about that yeah. particular group of women that do that. But. It's like they get sick of uh, the focus on themselves, mm. as you would, because you know, the focus is on you know objectifying their bodies and men lusting after them. And in order to do that, they just remove themselves from the, the human world and work with animals. You know, and, uh, the, you're... the Pamela Anderson series, by the way, on Netflix, it's awesome. She's amazing. Really? Yeah, it's really great. Do you reckon there's a thing to be said for, like, you look at the, the for, for a model or whatever, there, there comes an age where all of a sudden it, it is like the racehorse, is like, okay, the use of this animal for the racehorse, in the case of the racehorse, is now done. Well, what what else are we going to do with it? Mm. And there's a there's a bit of a parallel to like I think that when almost like sports people, a lot of sports stars get into that sort of you know, oh, what am I going to do post career? And sometimes they get into this sort of stuff as well, where it's that thing where I'm not actually useless any now. I've just the original use you had society had for me has moved on. Yeah. That I, I think that that transition is all the way through life, but I think particularly as you age, and you know, if I'm talking about a third act, I'm you know, obviously age is bringing its weight to bear on me. You you soften, you soften emotionally. Mm. You you just start looking around, thinking, you know, to survive in this dog eat dog world that we're in, you need to be a little bit of a hard ass. You need to be self absorbed for a start. I've spent. Yeah. A lot of time thinking about me and what's going on in my life rather than being outward about family and friends. So, yeah, you become a self-absorbed asshole 
And as that part of your life transitions, you think, oh, I, want to, I want to do something that makes me feel really good about myself. Yeah. <laughs> Being so, a bad person. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm more than just my funny thoughts. I'm <laughs> yeah, that's right. I am. I contain multitudes well, uh, and the, I want to want to do something else. And the other thing is it is so like temp like this like with comedy or even like any sort of sort of show business type thing like you know you've done stand up radio television it's all like so important in the preparation it all leads up and then as soon as it's done it, it's just like you know you do a TV it show it's, it's just ether. done it's in yeah. the ether and that's all right, and especially next? now with the huge churn of content on streaming services the amount that we're watching uh, that we don't even once upon a time there was Get Smart and MASH mm. and you know Doogie Hauser or whatever your series yeah. was and you'd watch those series and then you'd watch the repeats and you'd be right into it and you'd know everything about it but now you know people aren't going back to what I've watched The Sopranos three times but I'm probably not going to go back and watch Succession yeah over again I'm the you know, exact same so I'm we're just churning through a huge volume of content and what we do it just disappears yeah, and, and and so it should because we look work live most of the time. You know, I I don't know how you feel about stand up specials, but I go along to stand up, and I have a great time in the audience because it's live. And I watch a stand up special, and I might laugh occasionally, but I won't laugh like I would live. I've actually had this conversation lately with a lot of people with where I'm saying it's just not it's. it's I not feel stand-up. like it's not stand well. It's because the the best stand up specials, um have now seem to have an element where it's more like what i was trying to explain to someone recently a younger comic they're talking about yeah shooting a special and you you know how hard it is to make it look different i said i think the key in my head now would be you don't look at it like you're shooting stand-up you're making a a short film or a film that is you talking on stage like it's not a it's not a complex film but you've got to look at it like you're making a TV show that someone's going to watch, not you're doing stand-up that someone happens to be taping because it's two separate Absolutely. ways people consume it. And then, I, I, like, I'm the same with stand-up specials. So many of them I sit and watch and I'm like, oh, that's fine. But you know if you were in the room, you'd be howling. You'd be rolling with laughter. Yeah, because they're also edited, which uh, stand-up isn't. Yeah. So, you know, there's slips of the tongue, there's moment, there's pauses, there's interactions where they probably just go, let's lose that because yeah. it's, you know, doesn't make it as funny or the the joke count's not as high. But I, I yeah, I don't watch stand up specials anymore. The magic of the magic of live is sort of is what appeals to me about it in a lot of ways. Yeah, and sitting next to a stranger, you know, or behind a woman who's pissing herself laughing, and there's you know other elements that yeah. are dragging the lighting the fire for you. So I. I I like the idea that what we say on stage is gone, disappear. Mm. When I see someone with a phone, I just want to say, well, I do say, just put your phone down, just enjoy it. Yeah, be here. Yeah, I don't mind being filmed. I couldn't give a shit, but just for your own sake. You see them with their phone at their chest. It's like, what are you going to do? Go home and watch (laughs) what you've just sat through. Well, when we were doing the, um, our, the, I remember one night we were doing the rugby league show at Fox and someone had their phone up and like when we were doing it at the start and I said, oh, you don't see all these guys with the big cameras. <laughs> Do you want to watch this later? Yeah. It's going to be on TV. Yeah. So, yeah, you can go home and actually watch this on the just, telly. Yeah, just sit and enjoy it. Like yeah. it, I think too, you see that at concerts and stuff, people like, I'm like, one, you're never going to watch it. But two, like don't just... So for me, it's like, why wouldn't you just be in the... Be in the moment. In the moment. Yeah, it's so someone can post on Insta. Yeah. And just go, oh, I was at Ed Sheeran. But it's no one wants to see that. And if they want to see Ed doing, you know, whatever song he sings, they can go <laughs> online and see it really shot quite well. Yeah. and the, the, But the other thing with that is, too, is the bigger the event, the more, like, the more, oh, mate, I was at the Ed Sheeran at the MCG. Yeah, so were 100,000 other people. Yeah. Like, this is... the. the the more that, interesting that thing is selfie the... of like, yeah, there's Billy Joel at his piano, yeah. blurred in the background. At Billy Joel, the MCG, 
Who gives a shit? Mate, you want to impress me? Do have, Show me a photo where Billy Joel's taking the selfie and you're in the background. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the one. <laughs> that's the impressive selfie. Piano Man, by the way, is a terrible song. Really? You don't like Piano Man? Yeah, Piano Man's a, a cruel song. It, he hates the people in that bar, okay? Oh, it's a, that, that's kind of why I like it. It's, it's, he's singing sweetly about a situation that actually in, the, in reality... For a performer, he's at a low point. Like, yeah, but he's like, and I'm going to do some material here. Pretty good crowd for a Saturday. The manager gives me a smile because he knows it's me. They've been coming to see to forget about life for a while. No, they're not. They're they're in there drinking to forget about life. They're bar yeah. flies and drunks, and they were there before you turned up, and they'll be there long after you're gone. That's why they're there. Okay, so how about you shut the fuck up and tickle the ivories and stop <laughs> passing judgment on the, my customers? Mate, it's it's you or a jukebox. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and, yeah sure. You bring the place alive, but to, yeah. tomorrow night when you're playing the MCG, those alcoholics are still going to be here. Yeah. Well, I think, because wasn't that written in a point where he was fighting with his label like his his first label like basically owned all his music and so he was right. he got screwed over and so he was just back playing in a in a bar to play out the because he was basically had to sit out the rest of his contract oh. otherwise he was going to be no i didn't know this yeah i think that's the story now the provenance but, of piano man yeah and so and that was this thing with and that's behind that line and they sit at the bar and put bread in my jar and say man what are you doing here right was he'd already had a little bit of success but that success was entirely owned by someone else and he he was basically on the back burner um are you do you like other than that one, are you a Billy Joel man? Like, I, or it's probably a bit much to ask. Are you a Billy Joel man? But do you like his music in general? Oh, uh, yeah. I I had uh, best of volumes one and two, and um, there's a lot of songs there. The the lesser kind of like songs. I think it was Fifty Second Street is a great album. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I I suppose I'm a fan of Billy Joel. Yeah, yeah, but um, we got it here on tape. Great. Lawrence Mooney <laughs> runs the but Billy I'm Joel talking fan to Davey, club. who's still in the navy and probably will be for life. Well, the guy's devoted himself to the armed forces. People, <laughs> you know, uh, and it's not just because his name rhymes. And what is right? a real estate novelist? What is that? A yeah, guy that's that works in real estate. That's trying to write a book. That is, yeah, that's one I don't understand. Mm. Also, the the businessman slow drinking to get stoned doesn't. Yeah. Doesn't reek of yeah. They to your point, they've come to see you, mate. Yeah, and stoned, of course, in the old days was being drunk, and then it took on a, a different thing. <laughs> the sixties, am I right, guys? <laughs> Pulling cones. Have yeah. you ever been a cone man, Barney? No, I've never really right. been a big drug guy at all. Um, let's let's start. Yeah, I, no, so, no, it, you've, I'm it's a, never I'm had a, appeal. No, I'm 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 a drinker. I right. like drinking. I like did. Yeah, Teens tr- like tried a little bit of pop, but it mostly just made me sleepy. Yeah, which is great. Like I love sleeping, but it wasn't. It's not a it was never a social thing for me. Whereas I like the social aspect of S- and I, sitting uh, around having a beer. Sitting around having a beer. I say that, but I, I often say my favourite drink these days is the get home after a gig on a Saturday night, done with work for the weekend. Everyone's in bed. Everything's done and i just yeah, yeah. flick on the tv pour a whiskey and just go well that's yeah i enjoy that one the late at night just on your own yeah all the world's been put to rights you've earned your dollar yeah your kids are safe and sound in bed the dog's asleep on the bed and you just go oh, i'm gonna get pie-eyed in front of the telly and yeah, watch rage i don't have to i don't have to be up early Everyone knows I work tonight, so that they don't have to know I sat and had three scotches and, yeah. and just yeah, another three scotches. God, but that sounds appealing. I'm going to drink some scotch tonight after work. Am I? It is. That's what I um first thing I did when I because I'm only down here for a week. First thing I did, was <laughs> I checked in, went and did a bit of grocery shopping, stayed in the Airbnb, and then just went and got a bottle of Jamison <laughs> whiskey. And that's every night. Just oh, you're night an Irish camp. whiskey guy. Um, that's the, I, I'm not a strict Irish whiskey guy, right. but I do like Irish whiskeys, but, um, so it's either Irish or Scotch generally. Like I'm not a bourbon guy. It's a bit yeah. sweet for me, but, um, I, Jamison's just the, it's one, it's, if I'm 
not going to finish the bottle. I'm not going to feel bad because I didn't pay that much for it. Um, it's it's what I call my drinking whiskey. Like if yeah. you just, I feel like one whiskey. It's it doesn't, a good whiskey. Yeah, you don't have mm-hmm. to. You don't have to feel like you know it has to be a special occasion. Yeah, because I've had some nice whiskeys. I remember for my thirtieth, my wife got me a bottle of thirty year old Glenmorangie, which is, that is good shit, isn't it? Oh, yeah. But it was like, whenever I'd go to have one, I'd be like, is this the right occasion? Whereas nah. I never think that with a bottle of Jamison. I go, uh, yeah, I feel like a whiskey. <laughs> yeah. Of course, it's the right occasion. Yeah. It's an Irish whiskey. Get it into you. Did tell you what I had in Irish whiskeys. I said ever... Irish whiskey, not Indian. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you... Mate, Indians are having a crack at the whiskey now. They're trying to make Well, it... the, the Japanese. Yeah, the Japanese are leading the, the world. The Nikka whiskey in that square bottle, that is a oh. great whiskey. We, you know Waka, comedian Waka, T- Takashi Wakasugi? He's a uh, he lives here now, but he's from Japan. I don't think I do know. Oh, Waka. mate, you'd you'd love Waka. He's a champion. He's he, his name should be Waka Waka, shouldn't it? Waka Waka. Mate, well, that's yeah. You, yeah. Mate, you're doing his comedy. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> he um when he first so he first started in Sydney when I not long after I'd started. He was working the door at this shitty little room, um where that was run by a crazy man, but um. Waka would work the door and he'd occasionally get thrown on for three minutes and then so that he built up and then he he went he was living back in Japan because he was here studying and then he was back in Japan working and he'd fly out and do like the comedy store for a weekend and because flights were cheap then and time zone um, is basically the same between here and Tokyo he'd be able to do the weekend so I'd just get we'd be doing right. five nights so together so he's, he's commuting he was, yeah, he was Tokyo. basically commuting at the time. So then, he, but I remember he used to just send me a picture of um, when we were working together, we'd be doing the store together. He'd send me a picture of five different Japanese whis- bottles of Japanese whiskeys, just saying, let's comedy this weekend. <laughs> and so him and I used Fantastic. to drink. We'd do, and then we'd sit and drink his Japanese whiskeys at the, uh, at the comedy store afterwards. They certainly perfected that process. Oh. They just, just took scotch and said, we're going to do to this what we did to electronics. Yeah, yeah. This is just a this is just a process. We can work it out. Everyone yeah. can. There's not not this uh, you know Scottish. Well, there's magic and then it's the yeah, water. Yeah. It's like no, it's not. It's water, mate. That that's too yeah, high. It's to water. Sh- yeah, we've got some grain. Yeah, well, we've got a kettle. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we, yeah, exactly. We can do this absolutely. You know, what I tried. I was we were away with friends um, just for a, like a little mid mid year holiday last year. Just saying to think. Me and my mate bought a bottle of um, the Pogues whiskey. The Pogues have an Irish whiskey, and I Do bought they? it. I bought it thinking, well, this is just a novelty. We're away. Like right. once again, if we, if we don't finish it, it's not. It was actually pretty good, and it's just called Pogues. Pogues, yeah. Because um, what's his name? McGowan was a massive alcoholic mm. and pisshead, but I believe that he has stopped drinking. Oh wow! Yeah. Did he, before he lost the last of his teeth, or are we? <laughs> <laughs> Losing a tooth, <laughs> that is a bad thing to happen. If yeah. you wake up and you've got a tooth missing. I mean, I've woken up in some states, but, you know, touch wood, I've never lost a tooth. That's, that's... By shenanigans. I've had stitches and dislocations, but that is the real, all right, I'm giving up now. And losing a tooth is the gut check moment where you can't hide that, okay, this went a bit far. Like, yeah. you're wearing, you're wearing the... <laughs> And people see a Ever. gap in your teeth and they say, right, loser. Yeah. You're a massive loser. Especially after an age where you, you might be conceivably playing competitive sport. Where they're like, oh, no, football, football, mate. Oh, yeah, it was yeah. football. Yeah, if, was it your... If you lose a tooth in your 50s, <laughs> oh, you've got to amend your behaviour. Right. Have you ever seen, there's a great um, Shane McGowan and Nick... Shane Cave. McGowan, that was it. Yeah, they did, Nick. him and Nick Cave did a duet of What a Wonderful World. I've never seen it. Oh, it's on YouTube. It's amazing because they're both, I don't know if they're putting it on, they're both clearly drunk. Like clearly just, because at their peak, that would have been a, you, a, an interesting weekend to spend with those two when they were partying. But um, wow! They yeah you know, they they go to the bit they get to the bit where they do it like because the basically the whole film clip is is like they're doing karaoke they're sitting in front of like a you know little background like they're doing a doing a karaoke and they get to the bit they see friends shaking hands and they have about three 
three sort of goes. They almost miss shaking, shaking hands. hands. That's how fucked up they both are. It's great. And it's a beautiful, like, it's both of them, you know, they're, they're voices. So it's, um, That's, it's, it's got a bit that to is it. A, that is a must view yeah. later this afternoon on this Good Friday. I know you don't want to be time specific because you're probably going to put this up at another time. But we are gathering uh, on the day of our, our Lord's mm. crucifixion. Which we're getting to the topic of the podcast now. Right, okay. Um, yeah, how, uh, what did you give up for Lent? Uh, I didn't do Lent this year, but I have previously given up alcohol for the 40 days. Oh, how'd you go with that? Um, always pretty well, but you know when you get to Easter Sunday, then oh. it's just Lent's <laughs> yeah. over, and uh, it's just a massive bender. It's an Easter bender. So, um, no, I didn't give up anything for Lent. But my favourite Easter joke is, um, you know, happy Easter. I hope you have a massive resurrection. <laughs> Woo-hoo! <laughs> That's good. That's gold. You can bank that. <laughs> it's, like, it's like the people that have got, you know, everyone's got their Olympics bit that comes around every four years. Yeah. You just dust it off. Yeah, that's right. right. How's about these, uh, the, the ribbon gymnastics? <laughs> that's, uh, yeah. <laughs> the floor routines. Um I don't have any Olympic gear. You don't have any? Any Olympic gear. I don't think I've, I've ever had... I had some briefly, but I can't remember. I remember having an Olympic bit, thinking, oh, okay, I'll be able to improve on that every four years, and I cannot remember what it was about or why. I, I remember it. the a dearly departed Dave Grant used to have something about the 2000 Olympics. Oh, wow. And she said the, um, you know, Kathy Freeman's standing there and it's like the the world's waiting for the the torch to emerge and you know barry's in the control room like well we're fucked this up <laughs> just keep standing there kathy jeez hit, hit hit the switch again and he goes and then that final moment when it happens the most australian image ever the barbecue emerges from the swimming pool <laughs> <laughs> That is so good. Because <laughs> that is exactly what it looked yeah, like. It's like, oh my God. Right. Oh, so magic. We did this. So proud. I we, remember the... We the, done good. The night we got the Olympics, like when they announced it. And the winner is... Sydney. Sydney. <laughs> Sydney. He, um... One, that... One Antonio Samaranch. Samaranch, yeah. yeah. He, um... We all remember his name. When... The, the Saturday, it must have been, the, I don't know whether it was the, the exact night, it was the Saturday night before that, I remember watching The Late Show and they had their, and we used to talk about for years, they had a sketch about their, their uh, what the video was for, um, you know, for, for our bid for the Olympics and someone had written a poem and it was just, I forget who it was, it might have been Santa and it was just like, we haven't had him in ages, can Give us them. It's our turn. <laughs> <laughs> and they had the releasing of the chooks from the bat pen and the lighting of the uh, newspaper. The uh, that- the Late Show was an amazing show. It was so good. And the fact that it didn't keep going, oh, many a fan, heartbroken. Mate, but it was sensational. I was That was right in my hitting zone because that was, I was about that 13, 14. Right age where it was it kind of felt cool to be up you sit up late to watch it and it was just that you know you get that that 14 to 15 year old boy sense of humor where that's where your sense of humor locks in and you find what you start to find what really tickles your yeah and you end up finding something on your own too Mm. you're you're not watching with your parents you're you're casting around and you find something for me that was 11 or 12, I found the Kenny Everett video show. Oh, wow. And uh, English comedian um, from Liverpool, and he had his own variety show, but he played all the different characters. So he'd throw to a sketch and he'd be playing Sid Snot, or um, <laughs> he used to do this uh, impersonation of Barbara Streisand, but he just wear a massive nose. He was just inside <laughs> a huge nose. And then he would cut to these dancers called Hot Gossip. And as a young man with, you know, experiencing changes in my body, um, <laughs> hot gossip was like, oh, my God. That was the first time I was like, I want to 
do things. <laughs> <laughs> they, they taught you something about you. Yes, they. It's like I think I might be heterosexual. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I might be. You know what? It's it's been it's been a question, and it's, it's a shifting sand. It's been answered. You can never be sure, but <laughs> then it's like, yeah, they are working for me. Oh wow, that's so Kenny Everett. The other one for me was Jim Owen's show, right? Was because we were. I remember his Tonight Show, the Jim Jim yeah. Owen show. I remember going, like, that was the one where I was early high school and that was the one where you'd come in and everyone had come in quoting, because I think it was on a Sunday night mm. and Monday roll call at school, we'd be quoting it, like, look at you, you're huge, aren't you? Yeah. The, the going down, like, that was, everyone had to have a go behind the science benches in the in the science room, oh, so <laughs> just d- trying to do the d- escalator. D- descending, yes. <laughs> yeah, so that was... So Kenny Everett for you. What else? Well, I, I remember the Jim Owen show too when you know, I went to get my, my meal out of the letterbox and the snails had been eaten at night. I said to them, no, not letters, letters. Not letters, <laughs> lettuce. <laughs> You're meant to be eating the lettuce. <laughs> just good. so so good, simple, clean comedy. Like, yeah. It's just... Like and by clean I mean just clean in and out like yeah, not yeah but also clean yeah yeah he's never been a vulgarian Jim Owen no um and you know probably has his very broad appeal to thank for that yeah but yeah so how did you start in stand up well I uh, wanted to be a famous actor and so I started in amateur theatre uh, you know in near where I lived basically went to the local theatre company. Where was that? Where did you grow up? So I grew up in Bayswater in, in Melbourne yep. and uh, the 1812 Theatre Company was in up, Upper Ferntree Gully. So my mum said, if you want to be an actor, you've got to go to the theatre. It's like, no, I want to be a movie star. And she said, yeah, the, you go to the theatre. So then uh, that was what I planned on doing and I started at the National Theatre Drama School in St Kilda um, and started going to the ESPY on Tuesday nights to watch uh, ESPY comedy. Oh, wow. And I'd previously seen Richard Stubbs at The Last Laugh. And in my head, that's like, that's what I want to do. I really want to do that. But, you know, I'm a bit of a slow burn guy, Barney. I don't, I'm impetuous about a lot of things, but not career. And so... <laughs> <laughs> I got a bit of that going yeah, on. Like, I'm very impetuous. Uh, so I went along and I thought, I'm going to do it. And a mate of mine was um, trying out comedy. He said, Just, you know ring up Trev, Trevor Hoare, who ran SB Comedy, and uh, try and get on. So I put it off for a while and then eventually stood up in 94. I was 29 and quite a late starter. And because it had a lot of experience on stage, had a bit of stage craft and, you know, what comedians call act outs where you just slip into oh, acting out the story. You were one of those guys where you start and you go, this, 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 something, and then someone goes actor and you go, oh, okay, I get it. Yeah. You don't look nervous at this, like... Actors no. understand they they look like they're supposed to be there. Yeah, you own the space. Yeah. And you take your moment and you know which way to face and mm. you don't do a joke upstage and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And so it came to me I, pretty easily and uh, fortuitously I was also funny. And so other comedians um, really start you off because other comedians see you doing a, a gig and they say listen, I'm doing a footy club or I've got this gig or you should ring this guy. And so yeah. that escalated pretty quickly for me. And then uh, I got into a duo with Damien Callanan and we ended up doing the our first Melbourne International Comedy Festival show together in 98. Oh, wow. And then we did a couple. We were nominated for the Barry Award, as it was called back then, and uh, won the Moosehead Award and it was rolling on. And then I thought... This is fun being in a duo, but I've got to share the glory. <laughs> I don't want to be doing that all in my career. I'm only getting half the attention. Yeah, here. I don't want to be some kind of Lane on Woodley outfit where it's a collaboration. <laughs> Fuck that. <laughs> and so um, became solo, and the rest is history. I've been plowing my or plying my trade for. All these years. And as we heard at the beginning of this podcast, I think I've just announced my retirement. <laughs> <laughs> well, what happened to Lawrence? He was a horse trainer of some sort now. Yeah, he, uh, he did Barney's podcast and uh, then he just walked 
into the bush and he's never been seen since. Yeah. He's like the man from Snowy River, but a really old shit one. Yeah. <laughs> he, doesn't, he doesn't ride down the... Uh, remember that, remember that, that, that big stunt in that was ride, he rode down a really yeah. steep hill. Riding downhill is a very difficult thing mm. to do. Uh, it's difficult for the horse, it's difficult for the rider to stay on because essentially you're leaning back as far as you can so you don't go over the top. Um, so my plan this year is to um, actually, Drunky's being ridden by people who know how to ride horses and I want to get on him and ride him this year. So Oh, how good. Yeah, they say that men over 50 shouldn't get on ladders, let alone former race horses. But <laughs> Hey, why not? Hey, it's good enough for Christopher... Oh. Oh. <laughs> Everyone just yeah. goes. You buy a motorbike, people go, "Oh, temporary Australian," or "My mate slid yeah, yeah, under yeah. a bus." Or everyone's got a horrible story. Same with horses. Uh, the amount of times people reference Christopher Reeve, what happened to Superman? It's like, yep, I get it. You can fall off and break your neck. Yes, mm. you can. Uh, but lots of people don't. Yeah, lots of people don't, and lots of people. Look, you can. <laughs> I, also, but I also think, like, you know, okay, look what happened to Christopher Reeve. But then you go, like, accidents can happen pretty much. Like, look at Michael Schumacher. He had the most dangerous job in the world for years and years, got away fine, and skied into a tree. Innocuous skiing accident. Yeah. And what the big danger was, you know, in that car going at upwards of 300 kilometres an hour in a straight... He had a helmet on that is highly buffed and brand spanking new. And anyone that rides a motorbike knows that if you drop your helmet, throw it away, mm. get a new one. It's not worth having a, a shit helmet when the crisis arrives. He had a GoPro on his skiing helmet. And really? so it makes an uneven surface. And uh. so it was the GoPro that punched through the helmet into his head. Oh, that's a... Well, that's a idea. Because like, I often look at the people with GoPros on their helmets. Like, just, you know, the people you see just riding their mountain bike on a footpath with the GoPro on their helmet. And you go, yeah. when, when are you watching this back? Yeah. What are you? <laughs> yeah. What are we documenting here? Yeah. So, that, uh, I mean, Michael Schumacher has never been seen in public since. And I believe, mm. you know, uh, has a severe brain injury. But I think that that was the case. Like, the GoPro punched through what should have been a very even surface. Yeah, which is the, and that's and the, what a horrible kind of irony, really. Yeah, to have that job and then skiing accident. Yeah, skiing's the, dangerous though. Oh yeah, but it's it's always that thing that you know you hear about that people like they do for years without incident, and then that's the one thing. Like, but that's anything in life. Like, you can't l yeah. live life worried about your insurance uh, actuary would yeah. say yes, that's true. But why don't you? mitigate the possibilities you know wear a seat belt don't smoke yeah sleep don't buy drugs from a man called ballsack and not a pharmaceutical company <laughs> yeah. you know there's things you can do to ensure your safety and longevity so i'm i'm tossing up about the horse but i want to do it and that and that's the thing like you okay you might live a long life but if you're living a long life staring at a horse you wish you'd tried to ride 25 years ago then you know like you might as well try it you're not gonna you know like if you take the steps you learn to ride you you know you do it all like sensibly then hey, mitigate the risk speaking of horses um mm -hmm. when i'm grooming drunky and uh, he gets very relaxed his penis fully distends <laughs> so uh this is this is the grooming chat i thought we'd this, have on yeah, this podcast this, how long has it taken you to get around to this? So um, he's had a thing called rain scold and you, the, the best thing for it, it's a form of dermatitis caused by rainfall, uh, is to rub coconut oil into their faces. Or So that's the picture if you drive past my place. I'm rubbing coconut oil into a horse's face and he's blowing hard through his lips and his penis is fully distended. <laughs> and you're thinking to yourself, there's something wrong with this photo. Yeah. Um, but I was speaking to a mate of mine who's a vet and they have this um, scale on their penises. Uh, and I asked him about it. It looks like if you were badly sunburnt and the, your skin was peeling, it looks like that. Oh, wow. It actually looks like skin. He said, 
that's um, dry smegma because uh, when the horse, you know, in order for his penis to fully distend, it needs a bit of sebaceous lubrication. So he goes, you can just pick that off. Um, <laughs> he won't mind. It feels well, nice. I'm sure he it. won't mind. I'm sure he won't mind. I said, I am not doing that. I don't want to, that photo. Yeah. Where are they now? Oh, we found Lawrence Mooney in the country interfering with a horse. So God, he loved that horse. He lo- He spent hours out in that paddock descaling that old penis. Uh, we miss him. Feels like he put some of the smegma on there just so he could pick <laughs> yeah. it off the next day. So yeah, it looks like kind of dry glue. But um, I said, and it just drops off. It doesn't affect him. He goes, yeah, yeah. It's just if you were showing the horse and you were grooming it, you know, to with an inch of its life, and you know, po- putting nail polish on its hooves, so blacking the hooves. He said they all descale penises. So oh man, I said, yeah, yeah. just. How about leave the horse's cock alone? <laughs> yeah. Just get on with your life. Yeah, that's a... Who's... <laughs> what a job. But yeah, if you're showing the horse, who's judging? I'd oh, just see a good horse, but just see the scaly penis? Yeah. Marks off for smegma on the penis. Yeah. <laughs> you never see that scene in Yellowstone either, do you? Where you got Rip and the other cowboys there descaling the penises of their horses. No. There's something very wrong with that show. Um <laughs> The bunkhouse is no good, and mm-hmm. you don't want to be taken to the station. When you ask the question, what's your name, what do you do, what's the most difficult answer that you've ever had? Um, I'm trying to think. Most Comedians always struggle with it because most people, it takes a long time for comedians, I'm, I'm discovering, to be comfortable just going, I'm a comedian. Yeah. Because of I don't know it's it's one I think it's a it's one of those jobs that where you it takes a long time to feel like that, okay well I suppose I'm doing this now rather than ah so just to say I'm a comedian yeah so you're coming through the airport and you put it on your immigration card occupation comedian yeah, yeah. where a lot of people I think a lot of people will give me like three or four different things when they are comedians but they it's just you know they they that's I find a lot of people have that problem. but Because it's that thing where I think when you start, you don't want to... Because we all know the open micer. It's like, yeah, I'm a comedian. And mm, you're like, oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, yeah. Mate. You get up once a month and work at a bank. But whereas... So everyone's... I think anyone who's taken it seriously gets cautious of being seen as that person. And especially, I think a lot of comedians and most good comedians have a little bit of imposter syndrome where they feel like oh, man I'm getting, oh, totally I'm getting away with this how'd this happen and that can happen on stage too when you're in the middle of a show and the audience can be roaring with laughter and you can be and you think oh, fucking, am I doing this is this is am I doing I, am I responsible for this I had that in this an audience too big a reaction in an audience where I I had a woman get start to get the like fit right. thing and i said that i actually said to her i said this isn't me i know i'm not that funny you've got something going on this is about you i mean because this is not a reaction i've had before and then that got a worse and it yeah all, but it's, it's amazing when people are oh and they're wiping their eyes and they're taking the big yeah. breath in oh Oh, do you ever have that feeling too, where it's going too well too early, and you're like, "Oh fuck, I don't know if the back end of the show is going to follow this." Yeah, you know that there's going to be a massive dip at about forty five minutes. Um, I do a thing with the audience where I tell them that it's nearly over, like we're coming towards the end now. So they kind of reset, so you can see people That's kind of smart. sit up and they take a big breath in. And it's like, oh, okay, yeah, got to make the most of this because by about. 45 minutes most people are thinking oh, i wouldn't mind a piss they look down yeah. at their watches or check their phones think oh god when's this going to end i think it's a it's a magic number it's like a golden mean at 47 and a half minutes people start to go right i'm ready for a change so in the that see that's where a lot of festival shows that's where the and i never knew my dad yeah like that's where the emotional and that's turn. yeah the day that it all went pear shaped, <laughs> yes. and uh, yeah, mm. so the the lesson. Um, yeah. So yeah, they do a little bit of a reset, and then essentially you're doing the last ten minutes, 
before you ask them to come out and buy your book and you do a <laughs> rank marketing thing yeah. that kind of undermines the whole show you've got this beautiful beginning middle and an end and then you go i'll be outside selling me dvd <laughs> It's funny because the appeal, like especially from the purest appeal, it's that thing of being able to say what you want to say. Like that's that's what draws you into comedy. You get up there and you get to share your creativity and your thoughts with the world, and then you get to that point, and then you go, "Now I have to get you to buy something." Yeah, because at every point, like which merch is, you know, it's it's great, but you've got to like at a certain point, you've got to pay bills, you've got to. Like you know, as much as the romance of the starving artist um, sounds like, it, I, I've noticed that the only people that talk about the romance of the starving artist are people who are long past starving. Yeah, and they've they've really made a lot of money in their art form because the starving part's not the fun part. No, but mind you, the when you're struggling, wh- whichever part of life, or whatever you're doing, whether it's be stand up, whatever that that part where you're struggling where you're beginning it's the most fondly remembered yeah when you're living in a share house and you're just starting out and you get a gig and you're so thankful because when you enjoy a degree of success and then you know financial security the struggle's gone you're actually deprived of the most glorious part of the job yeah so yeah starving isn't great but the struggle is everything in life to struggle is to live I, I love the struggle. So you've done, because you've done a whole bunch of different, like, so you've done TV, you've done radio, you've um, done stand-up uh, mm. throughout the whole thing. What what would be, like, what's your favourite out of them? Or what would, like, what would keep you, even if you won Powerball, is there one that potentially uh, would tempt you to stay? Yeah, the my favourite thing, um, I mean, stand-up is a glorious thing to do, but... Uh, if you do a show, you're doing a similar thing every night mm. and the beginning of the writing process, it's great because you're kind of like mixing it around and then you want to make the show tighter and funnier and so you start nailing bits down. So it does become a bit repetitive. My favourite thing of all time was Dirty Laundry Live on the ABC. It was a live, live show, so at 930 so you guys actually roll. went light, live to air? We went live to air. Which so. is, for a lot of people don't realise, that's not how TV comedy that usually works. That is not works. how it works. No. no. Uh, so we were a live, live show. And they said, why don't we you know, record an hour before and then we can edit it up. It's like, no, let's keep it live. So Dirty Laundry Live. So my producer would be in my ear and the credits would start rolling and the f- fucking nerves would take a hold of you. It's like, all right, your back is sweating. And then, and three, two, one. Welcome to Dirty Laundry Live. Tonight on the show, da, 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 da. Uh, This is the panel. Then I do, you know, a monologue, a bunch of jokes. And the voices in your head. Because you're not playing to, well, there was a live audience in the studio, but you're playing to... Staring down a camera. You're staring down a camera. Were you on auto cue um, for any of that? Like, did you have your monologue or any of it in auto cue? Yeah, so I was on auto cue, um, and which is its own challenge to a being challenge. able to read at a pace that someone's deciding you're reading to. The, you know, that voice in your side your head that's like, "Don't fuck this up." Yep, that was a very loud voice doing live TV. <laughs> but the exciting thing about it was, you know, if it sang and it didn't always you know, gel perfectly. I I don't think we ever did a a bad show because it was live and people would be, you know, stumbling and or amazing. So you're just riding this wave. But as we got to the end of the show, it's like, see you later. Thank you very much. The credits roll. The studio audience is going crazy. We all get up. We hug one another. Then we go into the green room and it was like playing the closest thing in showbiz I've ever had to like playing sport. People were chugging beers and going crazy and the (laughs) adrenaline. And we would stay at the ABC until probably midnight. They'd finally get us out of there. And uh, cast and crew, pretty pissed. And then we'd go to a bar in Elstonwick. And we'd always end up finishing around about three or four in the morning, on Friday morning, go home, pour yourself into bed. 
and then get up to go in to watch a viewing of the show. So four or five hours sleep and go back to the ABC to watch the show from last night. Oh, wow. And that was the most joyous time of my life. I loved it. I loved the crew I worked with. Um, just so happened that, you know, somebody at the ABC didn't like the show. Uh, there's a new broom sweeps clean and after three seasons, it was gone. That's uh, that, that That is the the trouble with like with television or anything like that is that you don't like i don't think the public realize how quickly that can happen like something's yeah. on paper it's it's successful it's you know it's hitting all its goals but just someone new comes through and uh, we, we're going in a different direction yeah it's like okay they, well. they don't like the cut of your jib and it's like being dumped they'll never tell you why yeah you know your girlfriend says it, it's it's not you it's me i just don't feel right when basically she thinks your your low hanging ball is too weird for her to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> it could have been the same reason that the yeah, ABC. Yeah. <laughs> did one of you? Did one of the executives see my ball? <laughs> no, Lawrence. They just, so they'll never say we hate you. Yeah, and we don't think you are the ABC. But that's what your subconscious says to you. That's where, and that's that messes with you too. Like we, like yeah. since finishing up at Fox, we've had you know all those you know the meetings you have and people want to yeah you we think you guys are good it'd be interesting we'd, we'd like to work with it and then, then it's just sort of okay you, you do some stuff and then you wait to hear and it's just like and then you bump into people they go you guys need to do this again like what happened to do your laundry live that was awesome and yeah so you've got to go through that process of explaining and yeah, why do. don't you do that again, Lawrence? You should just do that again. And they think yeah. it's a simple choice that you get to yeah. make. I'll, I'll definitely give them a call and ask to do it again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that was a great show, uh, though, Dirty Laundry. It Live. was a fan fabulous show. And part of the ethos of it was to bring new talent through. So very little known um, Ronnie Chang. Um, Reese Nicholson, I think you guys had on. Reese Nicholson was on as a contestant but Ronnie Cheng used to be a reporter that would interview you know yeah whatever uh, happened to that guy yeah he went to uh, America and he became massively successful oh that's <laughs> right yes <laughs> um, w we had on uh, Zoe Coombs Ma who went on to win the Mel Melbourne International Comedy Festival Award Sam Simmons as well so we wanted to build this team of newbies mm. and genuinely bring them on like um marty sheargold who was on nova at the time that was his you know first entree back into tv and now he's a regular on have you been paying attention a little known sam pang i was like yeah, yeah we were we good were coaching crowning. tree yeah it was it was really great fun and had a great ensemble of people um i thought i would have thought that we you know in terms of ticking abc boxes we were good to go but there was a controversy barney oh. there was a big controversy and when you'd say um was there an auto cue yes there was a script and an auto cue and i never went off that and just started making it up on my own but one of my opening jokes in season three was around charles sarchi uh appearing to choke nigella lawson in a mayfair restaurant he had her by the throat mm. um and that became big news and then a week later uh he dropped her via press release oh, broke Jesus. up the marriage by press release so um always been a nigella fan so the joke was um charles sarchi who was seen uh you know assaulting his wife in a mayfair restaurant has now broken off the marriage uh via press release whilst also condemning her in the press for not standing by him whilst he was under attack for assaulting her. Uh, and he's in advertising. He sounds like a real cunt. And <laughs> you can't say that on the ABC until you've got approval. So that cunt is written in a script. That joke's written in a script. It goes up the line to the EP yep. in Sydney. It comes back via our producers. And it's like, yeah, it's got the green light. So I say it. And uh, ABC Radio in Melbourne, you know, John Fane goes, well, this is a disgrace. This is an absolute disgrace. Mind you, it had been said on 
on TV on Sex in the City ten years earlier. Yeah, is this the new normal? People ringing in, how disgraceful, blah blah blah. Sydney backed away from it. It's like, mm, I don't think we approved that. It's like, I think you did. I think you, I think you might have. So yeah, I, I was had to wear that. That's, you know what? And standing by the like, since then you could probably stand by that. Oh, comment. Very, <laughs> Do you I'm, know what I mean? Like, it, it, very think, happy with that joke. I mean, and it's an the, advertising joke essentially. Yeah. He's done all these terrible things, and he's in advertising. <laughs> yeah, it's not a um. It's not a joke that one would consider controversial. I got knows how John Fane feels about the level of discourse we've got going at the moment. <laughs> Years later, well, it's interesting because I was listening to the callers call in, and this one called in and said, "Using that word denigrates women, and it leads to violence against women." And John goes, "Yes, yeah, you're right." And so I pick up the phone. I ring in. I probably shouldn't have because I was emotionally involved. Mm. So I go, we've actually got Lawrence Mooney on the line. I said, John, there's a lot of hysteria going on regarding my use of this word. And I've never used the word and thought about it connected to female genitalia or women. I've used it as like the apex predator of put downs, basically, mm. uh, as a term of abuse. So to say that it leads to violence against women is just completely absurd. You've got no evidence to support that. And he goes, well, I haven't got any evidence to support it, but you haven't got any evidence to the contrary. So he what? does this, like a year 10 debating comeback. And uh. I said, you, really? Is that the level of the argument? And he said, well, I personally think it's disgraceful, blah, blah, blah. I said, all right, John, well, listen, you know, we'll agree to disagree. <laughs> and... and uh, that was the end of the phone you, call. But you look at the... It also, from his point of view, why didn't he say to the woman who rang in, saying that, that the term denigrates women and leads to violence against women, in the big picture of what's going on here, the, you calling a man a cunt is not as bad was, was, as a man grabbing a woman by the, the throat. throat. Yes. Like, let's not lose sight of the inciting incident. Absolutely. So I am, you know... Uh, championing a woman who was assaulted by her partner and it's come around to my use of that word. No, I'm calling uh, out violence against women here. That, but anyway, that's the world that we live in where somebody can... This thing is really shitting me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so where somebody can pick out something you've said mm. and you know isolate it and then build their own case around it with... you know. No context, and there was no context given to the whole discussion. Yeah, that's. I just said the word. What do you think about that? Rather than he called someone that strangled his wife, that word, and that's... I like to protect the sanctity of it too. Yeah, I'm very selective about how I use it. Oh, well, you're you're one of the only comedians who's selective about how you use it now because it's every second person's using it all the time. Yeah, and stand up, but there's a. Uh, there's contagion goes through stand up, and I found myself using it too much. It's like, yeah, all I, of a sudden there's a trend and things. I've I've had a to... similar thing where I've I said it on stage a few weeks ago, and I just heard myself say it. I'm like, one, you don't usually say that. Two, you, you didn't need to say it. Yeah, you just it was it's that contagion that goes through stand up. I think. Yeah, and that's one of the great things about stand up. And people say, oh, is it difficult to be a stand-up nowadays, you know, with all the PC and the wokeness? It's like, no, you evolve. It has always evolved very quickly. It's a spoken medium. It's all about language. Mm. And so the language evolves. And so you, the, the audience will decide what's funny and what's not funny. And you move with that. And the appeal is you get to grow. Yeah. That's, you get to keep changing. If if you if your stand-up was exactly the same as it was 29 years ago, you'd be so bored of it that absolutely you would be and also if people go you know why don't you just do jokes that you used to do 29 years ago it's like because i used to hang shit on people with mobile phones <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah and probably wouldn't wankers. work yes <laughs> like what about mobile phones oh you know, these guys carrying bricks around 
God, yeah. I, in their bags, yeah. in the car. Who needs to be on the phone in the car? <laughs> yeah. Hey, mate, we are at time here. Um, I feel like we've barely scratched the surface. So if uh, if you're up for it, I'll get you back another time. I would I love to come back. Chat all day with you. Um, before we go, though, where can people find you online? Um, where can people find you um, trying to resist picking uh, smegma off a horse's penis? <laughs> Dry smegma. Um <laughs> I am uh, at lawrencemooney.com or you can go to the A-List website yep. and uh, check out And you out got a dates. podcast as well? I uh, did have a podcast with Matthew Hardy called Saturday Afternoon Fever about the reading of the book Saturday Afternoon Fever, but it's now been read. Uh, you can go and find Saturday Afternoon Fever if you were raised in the suburbs. It's really about rites of passage, but also it's about uh, a St Kilda tragic uh, who would never make the grade. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Lawrence Mooney, thank you very much for joining me. Thanks, Barney. Cheers. Mm-hmm.